Hi, this is Sean O'Brien, CSO at Pancrake.com, and you're listening to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Kerry Parker, and this is episode 259 for February 14th, 2022. So that means it's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. We have a wonderful interview show for you today. I'm going to be talking with Sean O'Brien from the Yale Privacy Lab and also uh, associated with a project called Panquake, which we are going to talk about more uh, in the show and quite a bit, actually, in the bonus content. Uh, one real quick note before I talk about the interview. Uh, if, you have, if you have Apple devices, uh, there's another security update you're going to want to get, and this is basically all of your Apple devices. If you've got an iPhone, an iPad, Macintosh of any sort, uh, there was a significant security bug that they fixed, so definitely make sure you get your devices updated. All right, so uh, it's a long interview, so I'm gonna. I've, unfortunately, I've got a lot to talk about around the interview too, so we're gonna run a little bit longer than an hour today, uh, but hopefully not too much longer. So today we're gonna talk about open source software, in particular, free and open source software, or FOSS. And this is gonna sound like it's gonna be super technical and geeky. And, you know, sure, it kind of is, but it also isn't. I mean, free and open source software is everywhere. In particular, the Linux operating system. Basically, all of your IoT devices and really anything, any appliance, any device today that has a computer in it that runs software is almost certainly running some flavor of Linux. And Linux is just another operating system. It's like Windows or Mac OS or iOS but it's free and open source. And because it's free and open source, that's what allowed it to be everywhere. And honestly, that is what has enabled so many things that we take for granted today. But it's not just about the operating system. We're going to talk today about some applications as well that you can run on your Mac, that you can run on Windows, that are free and open alternatives to some very popular and often very expensive software products. In most cases, they're compatible uh, with a lot of the ones that you know. Uh, in some cases, they're just as good, maybe even better in some regards than the ones you're used to paying for. So FOSS has been around a long time. We're going to get some of the history today from Sean. But it's kind of this socialist, communist, <laughs> altruistic vibe uh, of people just wanting to write good software and kind of give it away and make sure that everyone has the right to run this software and do with it as they please. Think of it kind of like Wikipedia. I mean, who would have thought years ago, you know, I remember still as a kid getting the Cyclopedia Britannica. It was a really big deal that our family had a really nice full set of encyclopedias, these massive books with information in them. I mean, who would have thought that someday so much of that information and more would be contributed by people all around the globe for free and updated constantly for free and it would be so successful. And yet, there it is. So kind of keep that in mind as, we're, as you're thinking about this today and listening to this interview. The couple of terms we throw out, and we throw out plenty in this interview that I'm going to talk about a little bit up front, and then I'm going to circle back and do some after a little bit more sense, I think, after you hear it. But we're going to talk about Linux today, which is, again, that's an open source operating system like Windows or Mac, except that it's free and open source. And there's different flavors of this. We call them different distributions or distros. Uh, and one that you may have heard of, if you've heard of Linux at all, is called Ubuntu. And <laughs> that sounds like a weird name. And yeah, it is kind of funny to maybe to say, but it has a very, actually a very heartwarming meaning. So I'll leave that as a uh, exercise to the listener to look up and find out what the meaning of Ubuntu is. But it's it's just the name of one of the more popular flavors of Linux. We're going to talk about software licensing a little bit today. Uh, don't let that hang you up, but it's important in the in, in free and open source software, the free part of that in particular. We're going to talk about something called Git. That's G-I-T. Uh, it's a source code repository. So when you write software, if you want to store it someplace and version control it so that if I make a change, it can be reviewed and we can see what the differences are. And maybe we can fork a project uh, by forking it kind of like, it has the meaning of like a fork in the road where uh, you take a software project and you kind of copy it and then you just 
take it in a different direction. And maybe the original one keeps going, uh, but your fork of that project goes a different direction and it starts at the same starting point and then changes. So you'll hear him use the term forking. <laughs> in that case, that's what he's talking about. Also mentions Web3. And it's not Web 3.0, it's Web 3. You know, we had Web 2.0. These are all marketing terms. I don't know who gets to decide what these things are, but don't get too caught up in that. Web 3 is just kind of a slightly different new way of, of doing the web. I don't think anybody truly understands what it means yet anyway. But, you know, anyway, don't get too caught up on those kind of terms. Because of the nature of what we're talking about today, we're going to throw out all sorts of recommendations and talk about all sorts of products. So there's going to be a ton of links in today's show notes. So again, if you haven't figured out how to find the show notes for, for the podcast, today would be a really good day to find those because there's going to be a lot of links there. So we have a lot to get to today. Let's get to the interview with Sean O'Brien. Sean O'Brien is a lecturer in cybersecurity at Yale Law School and chief security officer at Panquake.com, which we'll, I'm sure, mention today. Uh, he's a visiting fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale Law School, where he founded and leads the Privacy Lab Initiative. Uh, he's been involved in the free and open source software, or FOSS, for approximately two decades, uh, including volunteer work for the Free Software Foundation and the Freedom Box Foundation. Welcome back to the show, Sean. Happy to be here. So I brought you here for a very specific purpose. In fact, uh, in my listener survey, which is still out there, but I'm already getting some responses. I've had a couple people ask me for some more stuff on open source software and something I've been wanting to talk about for a while. Obviously, totally makes sense uh, in, the, in the context of privacy, uh, but we're going to talk about some security aspects today, too. So uh, before we get into that too much, and it's, uh, it's easy to get really technical here, but tell me a little bit about, you know, what is free and open source software or FOSS? You know, you know where did this idea start? Sure. So, um, you know, when I talk about this, I try to bring it back historically to the early days of computing. And one of the reasons I like to do that is because when computers were big, bulky things, right, when they were mainframes and uh, people were sharing access to these mainframes, time sharing systems and so on, the software that ran on these devices, these, these huge computers, was not seen as a product in and of itself, right? right? right. So people were sharing, sharing the software, you know, when printers came out, they were printing out the code, sharing it with each other and so on and so forth. Um, so kind of the default for software, at least in the beginning, was seeing it that way, like not thinking of software as a saleable product or yeah, copyrightable right. product even. So uh, yeah, free software starts in that sort of setting um, when the operating system known as Unix, which had become, you know, pretty ubiquitous across a lot of these machines um, and what we now call personal computers when those started coming in. When the thing called Unix uh, got popular and people were sharing code and so on, but there was a turn by corporations to sort of um, lock down and make mm. some of it proprietary products, there was pushback against that. So the earliest, you know, sort of genesis of the term free software is with uh, Richard Stallman, who I'm sure mm. many folks know. And the GNU project, which he founded, GNU being a recursive acronym, meaning yeah. GNU's not Unix. Right. <laughs> so, right. Sort of the geeky thing. Yeah. And Stallman uh, wanted to make sure that you could not only run the software for any purpose, but that you could share it and um, that the software would be modifiable by the people who got a copy. Those freedoms, which uh, the Free Software Foundation and GNU Project um, call freedoms zero through three. Um, so again, That's very... good computer people starting with zero, yeah. Exactly. Freedom zero being the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one, the freedom to study how the program works mm. and change it, right? Which is huge. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I think a lot of folks associate with what we now call open source. The freedom to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor. Um, so there's always this sort of um, community kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, freedom three being the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions, which is crucial and probably more crucial these days with the internet. So that's the thing called free software, right? And uh, the GNU project basically reinvented Unix uh, piece by piece, building the components to be Unix-like, Unix compatible, right? Mm -hmm. But to be under the these sort of ethical uh, software licenses that that respected these freedoms zero through three here. And then in the uh, late 90s, the kernel, which is the part of the operating system that talks to the hardware directly, the kernel Linux came out, 
mm-hmm. um, was released by Linus Torvalds, and that was released uh, in 1991, actually, hmm. and uh, distributed on the internet. So that component was under the GNU General Public License, which is the what's called copyleft license that respects these freedoms, that makes sure that people, when they modify the source code, they in turn, if they distribute those modifications, um, have to release it under the GPL again. Mm. So it's sort of this refreshing of the commons constantly. You release the code, the code can be modified by someone else. Then if they distribute and release the code, then it has to be released under a compatible license that also allows people to keep modifying and so on and so forth. So that became GNU Linux, um, (laughs) the thing that most people now just call Linux. Um, But the GNU portion is something I make sure I always want to underscore. It is important to really um, talk about that aspect and make sure we respect the fact that the GNU project started this whole thing. When Linux took off in the 90s, when we had the real push for, you know, um, the thing we now call the web, open source became the terminology that most folks used for the thing that was called free software. Mm. So then you end up with all these other (laughs) acronyms and so on. And I like to settle on um, free and open source software, AKA FOSS. It's, It's a nice combination term that respects both traditions. Open source being more about the process of developing, distributing, modifying software for a sort of a businessy context and free software focusing more on the ethics and the freedoms. So that leads to this other point I want to make sure I bring home, because I think just from a historical, certainly from a geeky perspective, this is something that you commonly see in the literature. And and that is this, is it free as in beer or is it free as in speech? So uh, (laughs) which which of those is FOSS or both? Yeah, so uh, free as in beer would be gratis, right? Um, Something that you get for free, like, you know, with a coupon or something or some Mm -hmm. free giveaway, right? Cost free. And Libra, right, the, the term meaning freedom is the freedom that free software cares about. That's also why you'll be hearing software Libra sometimes or Libra Office, a product people are probably familiar with uses that, that word. The most important thing is that it is free in the sense of freedom, although cost tends to create friction, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of free software is also cost free. Um, especially apps which are actively developed by small teams through the internet and so on. I could see how a lot of people might, you know, look at FOSS and think, oh, <laughs> this sounds a lot like communism, you know, <laughs> interesting in the abstract sense, but, you know, it doesn't seem really viable in the real world due to, you know, basic human nature. So how do FOSS projects, you know, thrive in a world driven by capitalism? How could you make money when you basically give away the source code? Yeah, so that's uh, certainly a common thing. I think less common now as, as, as FOSS is pretty much, I don't want to say taken over, but it's everywhere. But yeah, I, I tend to embrace those sort of revolutionary aspects of it. <laughs> I actually do see some very um, strong uh, connotations with socialism, one of the branches of socialism, anarchism, um, workers' movements, mm-hmm. some of the ideas from the Reformation and the Enlightenment about freedom of thoughts and information. That's all wrapped up, certainly, in free software, free and open source software. At the same time, you know, there is certainly a a free market libertarian sort of strain that is definitely um, very well known throughout the internet, throughout the business world at this point. Having the ability to uh, modify and share source code frees up an enormous amount of intellectual capital, basically, right? So instead of having small teams that are sort of doing their own thing, locking up their code, you now have a code base that you can modify and build on and fork, right? Make a new version of, and all of that sharing, all of that refreshing of what we now call the digital commons um, that generates and has generated an enormous amount of wealth. Because you can share, you can also sell. So some people do, especially in the early days, you know, they were selling the physical form. So you might sell the CD associated Mm -hmm. with, let's say, Red Hat Linux, right? Mm -hmm. Now the business models tend to be more about support and customization, Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes some sort of subscription access to a platform that also is releasing all of its code as free software, free and open source software. Um, So there are business models, certainly you can build, and there are 
you know, I mean, the all of the software companies worldwide, including Microsoft, um, have in some way embraced FOSS mm-hmm. for this reason. It's so powerful from a development standpoint. I know the early sort of models for software cost, uh, source lines of code, for example, free software just breaks through all that stuff, right? Um, there were studies of Debian in the early uh, 2000s, Debian being a, a distribution of the thing we call GNU Linux. Debian basically broke all the rules because when it was studied, it was like, well, how did they develop so much software, so many source lines of code and put it in a software distribution with such limited time? Um, You would have to have, you know, billions and billions of dollars and who knows what, some astronomical number of hours. So, so the traditional metrics were just blown wide open and a lot of the success and really the the money that went around in the early days of the web, certainly the dot-com era, um, and then into what we now call web 2.0, which we're kind of moving out of. Mm. A lot of that wealth has to do with the fact that um, FOSS opened up this intellectual capital and allowed software to be shared, modified, and people to build businesses on it. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot. I mean, I've I've been a software engineer for many years, and there's there's a lot of effort involved, also in you know, things like DRM because it's you're trying to keep somebody from doing something that you don't want them to do. You know, there's a there's and it breaks things and it makes other things hard to use, and so there's a lot of friction I think that gets removed certainly in the software development process if you're like, yeah, well, we're gonna we're just gonna give the source, so we don't have to worry about any of that crap, and we can focus on other stuff, right? So mm-hmm. yeah, that, that that is a very interesting aspect to it. Now. What I think a lot of people may not realize, uh, certainly maybe uh, my my audience that might be more lay audience, is you know, that a lot of modern for profit software products, you know, Microsoft and a lot of these other companies are using under the covers, you know, FOSS building blocks, and because there's so much of software today is is about integrating building blocks. There are libraries or development kits or, you know, somebody's already invented the wheel and no one wants to reinvent that wheel. So you know, someone's already done it. Let's let's reuse that. And a lot of those components today are FOSS in some, or open source in some regard. Now, where it gets weird, and, and we bumped into this at Cisco a lot too, because we really had to keep track of this, is they all have different licensing. So it became tricky <laughs> to build a for-profit proprietary product on top of FOSS building blocks. So Maybe without getting too deep in legalese, maybe could you kind of help the audience understand how does that work from a legal standpoint? How are companies allowed to take this free and open source code, wrap it up in a little bit of proprietary stuff, and then turn around and charge money for it? How how does that work? Sure. So first, yeah, it, it's really important to recognize that that a lot of the wealth I was was talking about for especially these large corporations, the companies we now call big tech, a lot of them. They're taking components that are FOSS and, and building that sort of proprietary layer on top. And often that's the, you know, finished user interface, right? So Apple mm. does this with Mac, Mac OS, what used to be called OS X, um, because it was based on Unix and, mm. and a lot of GNU components. They tend to wrap it up in a proprietary interface. Now, from a legal standpoint, there's really two broad classes of FOSS licenses. The first are the ones um, that I sort of alluded to earlier called copyleft. And those are much closer to the um, the four freedoms mm-hmm. I went through earlier and the GNU project and so on. Those are the ones that require you, if you distribute or convey, is actually the, the legal term used in, in GNU pub. Uh, general public license version three, if you convey, aka, you know, put up something for download on the internet or put it in a physical form or, Mm -hmm. you know, in some other way, get software to people. If you do that, then the modified versions of that software also have to be distributed under the GPL v3 or compatible copyleft license, right? So that keeps that sort of replenishing of the comments going. Those are the licenses I prefer but a lot of proprietary companies are scared of copyleft for the right. obvious reasons, right? Right. right. <laughs> they don't necessarily want to release what they consider their secret sauce. Right. Unfortunately, there's quite a bit of what I would actually call leeching off of the community where mm. a huge code base that's FOSS is just sort of, you know, um, rebranded yeah, and, uh, right. and re-released. Now, the licenses that allow that sort of thing are the licenses that are probably most well-known to folks who look at like GitHub or um, some of these large collections of code repositories on the internet. 
These would be licenses that some people call copy center, and those are sometimes called permissive licenses. And those include uh, what's called usually the MIT license, although there's a more proper name for that because there's not just one MIT mm -hmm. license. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so the MIT family of licenses, I guess, uh, the BSD licenses and so on and so forth. That family, those, those permissive, so-called permissive licenses, they allow you to um, release the product as a proprietary thing um, and don't require you to disclose your source code okay. or disclose it under the same license. So those tend to be favored by large corporations and so on. Figuring out the compatibility of what pieces are in what yeah. um, is obviously a whole <laughs> field. Um, and yeah. there are certainly plenty of fossilers out there specializing in this for companies like Cisco and, and others um, trying to tread these waters. It is uh, somewhat controversial in some aspects because there are ways in which software linking is done, mm -hmm. uh, meaning you have two pieces of software which may not be sharing source code um, per se, but which are very closely sort of intermingled. And generally speaking, um, the interpretations have been um, favorable to proprietary companies saying, well, if you write a proprietary component that's linked in this way, then you don't have to release that code, that, that piece of software as mm. FOSS. You can link to the source, you know, the FOSS source um, and the FOSS components, but you don't have to release your proprietary thing. And that tends to be the way of the world. There has not been very much challenge uh, in a sort of courtroom sense, a legal challenge to um, to those sorts of uh, proprietary modifications or linkings or distributions, partially because the organizations who are interested in enforcing FOSS licenses actually prefer to get proprietary companies to come into compliance. Right. The idea is you want to have more free and open source software in the world. Mm. You don't want to just have a bunch of lawsuits that go right, on yeah. endlessly and, and and create all kinds of friction. I will say one famous example actually concerns Cisco, right? There were, um, there was a uh, busy box, which is basically mm. Linux and, and uh, some low level components along with the kernel. Um, busy box was in a, a wide variety of routers, um, the WRT family of routers. Mm -hmm. And if you get a router these days, and a lot of people probably have not paid attention to it, but you usually see on the box or a little insert sort of piece of paper, talking about the uh, GNU GPL version two, because Cisco lost a case basically that required them to release the source code for those routers. And that has spawned a whole family of FOSS router firmware. Um, you've got uh, OpenWRT, yeah. you've got DDWRT, you've got Tomato and all these other things based on it. So it's a very good example. It's sort of the case example of a proprietary company kind of screwing up, <laughs> definitely <laughs> screwing up. And then the source eventually did get released and now has sort of spawned this whole family of neat and interesting firmware. So, so there's one other aspect to this. And, and again, if you're not a software engineer, this might not be something you, you normally think about. But a, a, another aspect to reusing software components is what we call an application programming interface or an API. And there was another classic case that, that kind of set case law was Google versus Oracle, or maybe it was Sun prior to that because it went on for so long. Uh, and this was over the Android API. Walk us through a little bit what happened there. I, it's been so long, I, I can't even remember how that shook out. Like, what, were, what was the net effect of the result of that lawsuit? Sure. Yeah, it was a very long lawsuit. Yeah. Um, so without going into all the details, so um, those two broad categories I was talking about, the copyleft licenses and the, the copy center or permissive licenses, this case actually concerned something a little different, right? Rather than um, worrying about specifically the license that the source code of Java fell under, this case was about um, whether the API itself could be mm -hmm. copyrightable. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, in application programming interface, these API calls, the way in which a piece of software might talk to another piece of software, were considered so um, sort of basic and um, non-original <laughs> that they couldn't be copyrightable. If that decision had gone to Oracle, 
and those APIs could have been copyrightable, I think it would have had a really um, terrible effect actually on um, software development in general. Mm. Because having those very, very basic methods of communication able to be owned um, would have created a huge mess between so many different players, could have spawned a series of lawsuits. Mm. And I... uh, I'm very glad to say that uh, Google ended up winning that. Not that I'm a big fan of Google. (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) In this this case, it was really important for them to have won that. It would have been another example of sort of what I consider the over-intellectual propertization uh, right of yeah. software right um, we already have software patents for example right. which are sort of this mutually assured destruction situation <laughs> where you know ibm's got a patent portfolio and so does google and so does oracle yeah. and uh, they all have patents on the mouse and the window and you know yeah. these, these right. sort of and uh, you don't go to battle generally speaking unless you're a patent troll which you may have seen probably people calling companies patent trolls that just make money on patent suits or yeah. try to make money them you know you don't go to battle be over patents for these sort of low level um common components that are considered sort of non-original at this point and the the api situation would have been the same it would have been really really bad in my opinion in a world where everybody is trying to lay claim to something some more uh, intellectual property than they currently have it's not surprising that oracle did this a lot of the politics behind this has to do with the fact that Google Android uses Java. Mm. So, um, and specifically they were using in the early days, something called Dalvik, which was a a Java virtual Virtual machine, machine, basically. Yeah. So Oracle was kind of making those claims based on that. So open source software is often touted as being more secure, or maybe easier to secure because the code can be reviewed by independent third parties, unlike proprietary code where it's, these guys have graded their own homework. It's, it's all, it's all kept inside. Um, you know, so, you know, theoretically, this would allow bugs to be found and fixed, you know, potentially by interested third parties. Uh, but as we all found out recently with Log4j, that doesn't always work. So, you know, some even argue maybe the, the counterpoint that exposing the court, the code, you know, also gives the bad guys the ability to find out what bugs might be in there and just exploit them without fixing them. So all, what's your opinion? All, all other things being equal, is open source software more or less secure than closed source software? Yeah, so I'm a huge proponent of transparency for security, for the purpose of security. And other, you know, well-known security folks, uh, Bruce Schneier and some others, you know, they also talk about this. It's pretty standard practice in the security business to disclose vulnerabilities, and you do that Mm -hmm. for a reason, right? Right. And it's generally thought that um, the less that you can see code, the more likely there are vulnerabilities and exploits um, for that code. I, I, I guess there's a number of reasons for that um, that go a little beyond just the idea that, well, all bugs, you know, with lots of eyeballs on them are shallow. You know, there's, there's sort of this mm. phrase that if, if you have more eyeballs on something, it's going to, it's going to have less bugs. Mm-hmm. That's, that's partially true, right? But also when you're in a proprietary company, as you said, you know, that's sort of doing their own homework, um, doesn't have to talk about what they're doing or, or release it, the code tends to be developed in such a way where it's not studyable very well, Mm. right? You might not have code comments and so on. And also you may purposefully hide bugs, right? You've got to release Mm. this thing in a week. um, So you're not good. You don't, if there's a vulnerability, you just hope somebody can't figure it out, right? Maybe your manager is telling you to, even though you're saying to them, hey, if we release this thing, it's really, really dangerous. So having a distributed community that's potentially global, looking at the source code and scrutinizing it should fix those problems. Now, as you mentioned, Log4j and some other vulnerabilities, yep. um, the Heartbleed vulnerability in 2014 comes to mind with OpenSSL. Right. It's not impossible for free and open source software to have some pretty major issues. And in fact, given the amount of code that's out there, that's FOSS code and the way in which it can sometimes be sloppily implemented, you know, it, it, it can be a problem. But that's an issue generally with, you know, the business of writing code in the first place, right? Right, right. So, um, you know, 
when somebody talks about uh, proprietary software, you don't, you don't tend to hear people say, well, you know, Microsoft had this major issue with their code. There must be a problem with the proprietary model of writing code. Um, it tends to only be when there's a problem with something like Log4j, which is a big FOSS screw up this last year, yeah. <laughs> um, that that gets talked about. The other thing I'll, I'll mention here, you know, I talked about like the... Uh, the way in which intellectual capital was sort of opened up and that created an enormous amount of wealth. Partially what's going on there is companies which are huge multinationals, which have you know, huge customers and they're trading in the millions or billions of dollars. They're grabbing code from these communities and they're integrating it without supporting those communities of coders who are writing that code, right? So the open SSL project, right? It has a handful of people working on it. And that piece of software was behind and still is behind, you know, a massive amount of websites, pretty much every, yeah, right. every major server out there that's serving up web pages. So when the Heartbleed vulnerability came down the road in, in 2014, it shouldn't have been surprising. And, uh, you know, if these corporations want to improve the security, they have to help the upstream projects, right? They have to... Um, if they're going to grab the code downstream, so to speak, and release it in their own products and make lots of money off of it, some of that has to go back into the upstream to the original right. devs. And that's, that keeps the ecosystem healthy. Mm-hmm. And some companies figure this out. You know, they have their own employees spending, let's say, half of their time, quarter of their time, whatever it is, or maybe full time working on FOSS projects for this reason. If you look at the Linux kernel, you'll see tons of examples right, of right, it right, where right, corporations, yeah. they got a lot invested, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So they, they make sure that they are keeping that ecosystem healthy. And from a security standpoint, you know, that's, that's where you're going to have the most health. It's not just the eyeballs on the code. It's also keeping that sort of replenishing the commons, keeping the ecosystem healthy. And some of that, for better or for worse, requires money. People have to eat. Right. So right. if you're going to make your millions or billions off of FOSS, um, you better care about the developers who are writing that code. Well, another thing I've seen some companies do, and in fact, I think I just heard an article uh, re- recently about the EU actually getting involved in this, is putting a lot of money into bug bounty programs from that direction, kind of helping these things get more secure by getting some white hat hackers out there to beat on these things and find the bugs before the bad guys do and get them fixed. Uh, another great way for you know some of these for-profit companies to give back a little bit. Yep, exactly. So a, a couple more little devil's advocate questions or maybe clarification questions for the audience before we get into some more of the fun parts or we talk about some recommendations. But for people who are, again, maybe not software developers, don't really understand there's this open source code where I can go look at it and and get to it whenever I want and maybe change it. How does that actually work? Like, can anybody just go into one of these public projects and perhaps instead of making a good change, make a bad change? Do you do something evil in the code or... Uh, you know, inject a vulnerability that wasn't there before. It, it, how do how do we prevent that? And then, what about projects that get abandoned? And we've seen this happen. That you know, some nice guy comes along, has this pet project that gets picked up and used, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm done. I move on." <laughs> and and right. all of a sudden, this software just gets stale, including whatever bugs may still be in there, and never get fixed. So, those last couple aspects. What what would you say to people who might be concerned about open source software from that perspective? Sure. So, so these are definitely very much related to those other earlier uh, security concerns. The first thing I'll say is that there's a really wide variety of types of organizations or ways of organizing a FOSS project and build, building a community around it. Some FOSS projects are like very small groups of developers that are writing something that scratches their itch, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, they release it, maybe it blows up, maybe somebody forks it, like creates another right. version and that, because, you know. So, so then that's one way of doing it. Then there's nonprofit foundations that are behind some of these uh, code bases. So, you know, you might have uh, the uh, Apache Foundation or, or so on that are behind on um, these code bases, or you still have some sort of hybrid version of that, right? You have some paid employees, you have some, some volunteer folks, you have what they sometimes call drive-by contributions. So I find a bug or something that I want to add as a feature, and maybe it scratches my itch because I'm mm-hmm. working on some project that's tertiary to what these other folks are working on. There are ways of managing all of this from sort of a, a code software uh, development standpoint. One of the technologies which has uh, gotten pretty well known, which is probably 
going to be the de facto technology for a long time uh, in developing software is Git. Yep, yep. Git, which was developed for uh, the Linux kernel development, uh, but which is now far surpassed that and gone everywhere. Yeah. Git allows you to branch software, make changes, um, and then propose those changes to the organizations or the individual developers who are the ones who will ultimately commit that code to the version that gets released to the public. So there are sort of like safeguards in that way. You do a pull request, you make some change, you basically submit that change. Um, it gets vetted one way or another by the project. Um, the project may have, you know, let's say six people who are actually allowed to save those changes, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. um, to the actual code base that then gets wrapped up and released to folks. The other thing is that uh, most of this code is actually deliver delivered to people in products, in operating systems. So there are additional layers of vetting that go on beyond that. So for example, um, probably most of the, the uh, people who use you know, GNU Linux these days are using uh, some version of Debian or Ubuntu, which is based on Debian. Mm -hmm. And those operating systems have some pretty complex and interesting ways in their own communities of looking at what they call packages, which are bundles of code, usually mm -hmm. a program or maybe a library, like a piece of useful code that programs can use or could be, I don't know, wallpapers or cursors right, or something, right. icons. But those packages are also vetted in, in various ways. So to get some piece of code, like if I want to insert something bad all the way downstream to the user, there is <laughs> quite, a, quite a bit of barriers to get through. And I would say, and I certainly do reason and say this pretty often, that these checks and controls aren't perfect, but they are much better than the proprietary mm. sort of flip side of the coin. Um, to go back to some of the things I was saying about trying to hide or purposefully keep you know, vulnerabilities private, Microsoft Windows source code is shared with intelligence agencies through something called the shared source program. And so these agencies have access to the source code mm. sort of as it's like open source for Intel, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not Intel, the company for intelligence. Right, um, right. And uh, this has resulted in some of the worst vulnerabilities and some of the worst <laughs> security issues worldwide, right? So uh, when the shadow brokers, a group that released a bunch of leaks from the NSA, a bunch of vulnerabilities and exploits from the NSA, um, they released a... Uh, exploit based upon something called Eternal Blue. And Eternal Blue was a um, vulnerability that the NSA knew about, about five years before right. um, we had to deal with the fallout. And nobody ever fixed it. Doesn't seem like it was disclosed to Microsoft at all until crap hit the fan, right? Yep. <laughs> um, yep. And uh, after that happened and we had WannaCry, you know, shutting down hospitals, creating real worldwide havoc, you know, then these things get patched. And the way in which they get patched is still sloppy. So, you know, people still talk about how bad the patching, this is in 2017, March, right. and then April um, of 2017. They still talk about how bad it was that to fix those things in this major piece of proprietary software called Microsoft Windows that has been around now for decades and which has more or less conquered the world of what we would call desktop computing. So I kind of, I have to laugh a little bit when we're, we're sort of pulling apart and talking about, oh, well, what are the issues with FOSS security? <laughs> Certainly the proprietary side of it is, is not good um, right. and has proven to be really not good. And it's actually, I think, a testament to a lot of the checks and balances in FOSS that we don't see as many of these uh, major, major issues. And when they do come along, well, we're all talking about it, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, Microsoft, who knows how many bugs it's filled with, purposeful or otherwise, I'd rather have an operating system um, where I at least know that the code's available to be audited by experts, amateurs, et cetera, so. All right, so let's get some of the fun part now. It, and this is something I th that I think I haven't, probably given enough attention to on, on this show and that is some of these open source alternatives and because there there are well for one thing there are, there are a lot of them uh, and i i will say that some of them do kind of come and go you gotta you, you gotta deal with like any software project i guess but i've had some of my favorite projects come and then get abandoned and it's been yeah, kind of right. a drag but the, the key is that there's for all these proprietary uh, things out there there's almost 
I mean, I've seen tables, uh, you know, like you like this on the left, try this on the right. And it's, it, you know, here's the proprietary one, here's the FOSS version. And so I want to kind of go through some of that with you. And I think the most logical place to start would be operating systems, like the base of everything. And we've sure. talked, already talked about Linux. And there's not just one Linux, there's so many different Linuxes. So let, let's start there. Let, let, let's start with desktops. What, if I wanted to try this out, if I wanted to give Linux a shot, you know, what's the easiest way for me to, to get started, dip my toes in this? Uh, you know, do I have to buy new hardware? Do I need a whole new PC for this? And then how do I, how do I migrate? Because you know, I've already got existing, assuming I've already got an existing computer with all its files and applications on it. How do I, how do I move from one to the other? What are your basic recommendations for getting started with Linux? Sure. So for better, or for worse, I have been doing that for a long time, helping folks um, sort of migrate from proprietary operating systems or, you know, just integrate, you know, GNU Linux into their world, FOSS, FOSS operating systems into their world. And over the time period that I've been doing it, it was, you know, really hard in the beginning. Mm. And then it got like really easy to do. <laughs> and then there were some hurdles which have been introduced. And now it's getting back to the point where it's pretty easy these days to switch or at least try out seriously. A, a Linux distribution, right? Mm -hmm. First off, I would say um, I don't recommend um, doing what's called dual booting in general. Mm -hmm. I think that when folks try to have a Windows machine, let's say, or a Mac machine, and then also put, um, let's say, Debian or Ubuntu or Linux Mint on that device as well, they tend to stay in the proprietary operating system and not really be mm. spending time in, in the FOSS operating okay. system. Yep. And the switching back and forth is just not fun. Yeah. Um, shutting down and restarting, you know. So having a dedicated device is a really good idea. Having a dedicated device that is somewhat vetted by you, right? You can go online and search for a laptop you want to buy, let's say, and then say, okay, I want to look up this model and see how compatible it is with Ubuntu. And you can do that. There's a lot of good sites out there that'll tell you, oh, well, it's good, except there's some sound card problem or mm -hmm. something. Now, these days, there's a lot less of that than there used to be. So there's entire, you know, um, and I don't want to give a plug for a specific hardware company, but there are hardware companies out there that either specialize in shipping devices that ship with Ubuntu or, or some variant mm -hmm. of that usually, or they're just really, really compatible. And this is often because corporations are, you know, they've got fleets of programmers who kind of demand hardware now mm -hmm. <laughs> that's compatible yeah. with these Linux operating systems. So yeah, so I, I would say if you have a machine laying around that's not too old, because the older machines you can play with certainly and get Linux on them, but they're going to be more of a hobby project for you. If you want it to be your daily driver um, and you want to at least start getting used to it, you know, maybe you buy a new machine and you stick with the OS, you know, on the new machine, but the machine you just were going to put in the closet somewhere, you turn that into your, your Ubuntu machine or your Debian machine or your Linux Mint machine or Pop OS, which actually I think is probably the most friendly um, mm. OS out there at the moment. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and there are, and, I, and probably uh, in the intro or outro of this, I'll talk about some of those companies because I have no no qualms recommending a couple of them, but a couple of them, or at least to check out. But uh, it, like Dell, for instance, I, some of these computer companies, you can, if you're buying a computer, you can actually specify when you buy it, I want this to come with Linux. And then at that point, I would think you could be pretty well sure that whatever drivers are needed for that laptop are well covered and working. Uh, when you could order it straight from them uh, with Linux, uh, but you could also overwrite, you know, the, the Windows. I don't know if anybody's done that with Mac, but I know, certainly with a lot of Windows machines, you could just remove your Windows and put Linux on there if you want to go that route. If you've got, like you said, an older machine that you don't mind repurposing. But what, what about what about moving my stuff? Like, you know, I think one thing that would really help today is a lot of our stuff now is is less. Well, I don't, I don't know what percentage, but a lot of it now is in the cloud, like Google Docs, for mm -hmm. example, and I. Uh, maybe that's a poor example, but it, it does mean that like my documents don't really live on my computer anymore. They're really kind of in the cloud anyway. So like mo migrating my files, maybe my pictures might be harder, but are, are there, are there wizards or <laughs> do these, some of these projects help you migrate, not just start from scratch with uh, a Linux system, but actually help you migrate your life to a new box. Sure. And before I really dig into that, I just want to say on the windows and, and Mac issue, there are no Mac companies um, or, or companies selling Macs uh, with pre-installed versions of a Linux distribution because um, of legal issues that Apple has mm. foisted on everyone. So if it has an Apple logo on it, basically it's going to have a Mac operating system on it. And for Windows machines, I will just add one little caveat there. 
when I said things got a little difficult for a while and there were some hurdles to jump mm-hmm. over, um, Windows introduced something called, they call secure boot, mm-hmm. um, which requires a signed bootloader that's approved by Microsoft, basically, um, right. in an operating system approved by Microsoft. There are numerous ways to get around that these days, but just be careful when you're getting that new machine, because that will be the thing that turns you off from wanting to try a Linux distribution forever. And it's really not mm. the distribution's fault. It's it's because the machine um, with Windows on it may be really difficult to turn off secure boot. But yeah, anyway, uh, and the issue of, you know, sort of having a be your daily driver working in that world. Um, I've been doing it for a long time. I convert a lot of other folks to it. I, you know, young, old, my grandmother, my <laughs> brother, et cetera, and, and friends and family and students. And because I think a lot of the document formats have become more compatible, which right. is huge. Yeah. Um, so LibreOffice can open um, Microsoft Office documents pretty respectably across the board um, without any real friction there. That's been a huge one. And as you mentioned, a lot of people are doing their work through web apps, right? right? So this thing we call the cloud. And because so much of that's happening, you don't have to feel like you're a second-class citizen, right? You don't yeah. have to ask for the Linux version of the thing because if you're using, you know, um, Firefox or, you know, a, even if you're using Chrome on a Linux machine, you're not going to have a very different experience than if you were on Windows or Mac, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that does help quite a bit. I would say that you still have to have a little bit of a sense of adventure. Um, And I think, you know, you will have to learn some new sort of vocabulary and and user interface uh, when you're moving into this world. One of the uh, biggest barriers I think, and I've seen in workshops and, and getting folks converted, so to speak, is people get really used to just one sort of world of operating system. So you're a Windows person, you're used right. to the way that that works. You're a Mac person, you're used to the way that that works. Or, you know, there's whole generation now and, and also some older folks who only use tablets or phones, mm-hmm. right? Right. Yep. And if that's your, your daily driver and you're not really used to using, you know, these other things, it can be, it can be a little, you know, of, of, of a challenge. But I think the positive that comes out of doing it is you can really expand your your ability to adapt to new software, which is a really valuable skill. Mm -hmm. Assuming you're going to keep using a computer, which seems like we all are. Sure. Yeah. You know, these interfaces are going to change and, and being able to break out of that mold makes it that much easier the next time you have to learn something new. And I find this all the time that just exposing people to new interfaces makes it easier for them to, you know, deal with change as the software starts to change, you know, right changing around you for better or for worse. So it, it's it's a really good exercise in that. I would say there's an educational value to trying these different interfaces and ways of, of doing things. You, all the software doesn't have to be monolithic and be the way that Apple tells you it has to be, right? right? And that's a really, really important thing. It's fine if you're going to be logged into Apple for the rest of your life. But if you, if you have any plans beyond that, and, and I hope you do, then uh, then you really need to try out something new just to break break that mold a little bit for for really your benefit learning in the future. So I, I don't know specifically what to say is any real barrier these days. There's such a vast amount of software available on these uh, uh, Linux distributions that I don't think there's a single thing that I can think of that's a major problem, perhaps gaming. Although mm-hmm. now that Steam is, is oh, right, Linux-based, yeah. even gamers are starting to um, come over, so to speak. So, Well, I think the point you make is is it's actually, if you've ever made a transition from Windows to Mac or Mac to Windows, I, I don't think this is any more of a jarring transition. I, I, I think that it's on par. And I would even say that in recent years, it's they've all kind of gotten close to each other. Like, you know, I, 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 there's not as big of a difference now in my in my view from Windows to Mac as there used to be. And right. I think that's also true of Linux as well. So I, I, if you've ever recently gone from Mac to Windows or Windows to Mac, I don't think you would find this any more difficult or challenging uh, to go to Linux. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I would agree. I guess the part that I should have the caveat about is if you're a professional in a specific industry using a specific piece of software. So right. um, Adobe Lightroom, maybe you're, you know, one of those yeah, high Adobe powered. Suite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're used to using Photoshop and it's, it's going to be very hard for you to try to use some other photo editor, 
you know, that can create some difficulty, but that's also why maybe you just need a more sort of diverse setup and you have a, one machine for that kind of work and you have another machine for, for other kind of work. I do also think, and uh, obviously I'm, I'm a little biased, but I've also been working as a professional for a very long time and I've seen a lot of creative folks and so on. There is a huge variety of replacements for these mm-hmm. other things that have become ingrained as sort of standards in these industries. One of the issues with the uh, proprietary lockdown is that you end up on this treadmill always having to pay for the new version. Right, right. Certainly the Adobe cloud license is not wonderful. And the file formats aren't even compatible. There's some forced obsolescence there as well. So if I try to open, you know, Photoshop PSD from 10 years ago, good luck on what it's going to render like now, right? Right, right. And at least when you're using, you know, free software, FOSS operating systems, um, there is a care paid towards those kinds of issues. So if I'm drawing something in Inkscape uh, as an SVG, sure, you can also you know, use Illustrator to draw SVG files, and there's some broad compatibility between the two of them. But you're going to be much closer to the standard and, and much closer to um, compatibility in the future if you're using the FOSS version rather than Illustrator, which can introduce some sort of proprietary layer or filters, et cetera, on top of that. So, you know. Pro Tools and these kinds of things in the music industry. There's a lot of audio editors out there. There's a sense of adventure, and I'm not going to deny that, especially if you're ingrained to a specific way of working, there's going to be some challenges. All right, so let's let's rattle off some other potential ones, but let's finish up the operating systems. What about mobile? Because that, that's really tricky. I mean, again, with Apple, it, you're pretty much stuck with Apple. Um, but, but for Android or Android-based devices, you do have options. What are, what are some... Uh, uh, some operating system, some FOSS operating system options if you have an Android device. Sure. So broadly speaking, Android is the most popular operating system in the world. It's probably somewhere around 80, maybe even 90% at this point of phones mm-hmm. are actually Android. But in the US, obviously, we have a lot of iOS users on iPhones um, and, and some other places as well. But Android, because it has a basis in this thing we were calling Linux or originally GNU Linux, Android uh, variants are out there. There's tons of them. And probably the largest, uh, most well-supported Android uh, version um, that's not, you know, the stock Android that you get from Google or from your phone carrier is something called the Lineage OS. Okay. And uh, that used to be called CyanogenMod back in the Mm, day. Huge community of folks behind it. Um, They do a very good job of building specific software images for specific phones and then giving you the instructions you need to figure out how to get this onto your phone. Now, I'd still recommend, and especially in this case, because I don't want to say they're only phones because we use them constantly, but people tend to get phones more often than they get laptops, I Mm -hmm. hope. You might want to think about it for your next phone, right? Right. Um, You may not want to disrupt your life immediately um, on the phone you're using and then maybe something goes wrong with the flashing Mm -hmm. of the software and then you can't talk to anybody right so you can look for specific models of phone that phones that are going to be be better um, for something like lineage os there's also calyx os um, and the folks behind that the calyx institute are very serious about privacy and security i think they've done an excellent job um, bundling some really user-friendly software in there. Mm-hmm. And then I would also say, if you're not going to switch out of the version of Android you're using, even if you stay with what you have now, I spend a lot of time and probably the thing that I'm most known for is actually um, digging into security and privacy issues with Android applications. Mm. If you can get your code from a place besides Google Play, and the one I'm going to recommend is fdroid, f-droid.org, mm-hmm. You can download F-Droid. It's, I guess we'll call it an alternative or replacement app store. Right. All the apps are both gratis and Libra, so cost-free and free software. And uh, they've been really well audited for trackers, you know, privacy mm. issues, mm-hmm. uh, potential anti-features, um, <laughs> as they call them. And, uh, you know, if there are some issues... The, the description of the app will tell you. It'll say, oh, well, this talks to a Google server somewhere. So you may want to just be aware of that when you install this. So after it's a really good place for you to be getting your software from, it not only is going to give you all of the software, which is in Google Play, that also meets the requirements, the strict requirements mm-hmm. that after it has. Um, and that list is growing. But also you're going to get software from groups like the Guardian Project, um, and they specify in, you know, bundling Tor-enabled applications, Mm. and, you know, so you can have real anonymity when you're doing things. 
there they have things like obscura cam which allows you to easily you know blur out faces in a photo so maybe you want to blur out faces before you upload it to you mm-hmm. know twitter or whatever whatever um, social media platform you're using so after it's just really a good thing to install even if you stay in in the sort of stock android world okay all right. So what about applications? Uh, we, you mentioned a couple, like LibreOffice is a big one. Uh, if anybody would like, especially if they don't feel like they want to pony up again for Microsoft Office if they paid the past, or maybe they had it at work and now they're at home and they want to be able to access those docs, LibreOffice is, is a great option there. What else, what other kind of popular alternatives, uh, you know, for, replace this with that? Like, uh, what are the kind of recommendations might you give for popular Mac and Windows apps that people might want to replace with FOSS apps? So I should literally go down the menu of my operating system, but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, <laughs> for a media player, you should be using VLC media player. Okay. I think that's, you know, a lot of these are actually going to be familiar, especially to folks on Windows, yeah. um, I would say, because they're very well used. I'm still using Firefox and Brave mm. um, as my browsers. You know, these are, again, available on Linux, but, um, you know, instead of Chrome and so on. Um, for a replace this and that, you know, there's... Uh, GIMP, the GNU image manipulation program with the unfortunate yep. name. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. That's that's a replacement. And there's actually an attempt to, um, there's another project that is, is and I can't call the name right now, Gl- Glimpse, Glimpse, G-L-I-M-P-S-E, okay. that is renaming and rebranding it and also adding some features. But anyway, that would be a good replacement for Photoshop. Mm-hmm. Inkscape, I mentioned, which is a good replacement for Adobe Illustrator. There's... Uh, Got OBS Studio, which anybody who develops stuff for streaming or, you know, Mm -hmm. doing video on the web uh, should be pretty familiar with. I can't think of too many others off the top of my head. LibreOffice is a good one to start with. Right. Yeah. And and again, these are uh, available now as well on these other platforms, generally speaking. The teams behind this software have tried to make it so that you can ship, you know, so that they can have distributions elsewhere. And uh, so that people can use them across operating systems. And I think that's another thing which we probably should give a little more credit to allowing people to easily integrate into a full FOSS desktop. Now, if you're used to using LibreOffice because you never felt like paying for a Microsoft Office license or couldn't get it from someone at your work or couldn't pirate it or didn't want to, um, (laughs) you know, you're using LibreOffice maybe on Windows and maybe on a Mac. And so now you can very easily use it. On, on one of these Linux distros. So that that's there's not that many barriers these days. Part of the fun and the thing you'll find if you get into this world is that early on, you'll do a lot of customization and trying all kinds of stuff. And then as time goes on, you're going to do less of that. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to stick with the defaults these days and just make some minor tweaks. Um, and most of what I'm concerned about has less to do with the applications and more to do with um, some security and privacy concerns. All right, so one more area we haven't really talked about, and it's maybe it doesn't maybe it doesn't quite fit. But how does FOSS apply to so much of our, what we do today? Is our, our like you said, our web apps, um, which would be certainly social media, Twitter, Facebook, and those kind of things. But you know, Google Docs. There's actually a lot of web-based apps that we now use through our browsers. How does FOSS apply to that? And if if there are open source web apps uh, behind these things. That introduces a whole other financial aspect to this, where it's not just somebody on their spare time doing some code and making it available so someone can download. Now there's actually, mm-hmm. they got to host web servers somewhere. I mean, they've got, that that has ongoing costs. So how do they maintain, how do they maintain those things and still kind of give them away? Sure. So I'm um, going back a little bit to the history, because I like to always start there. Um, the killer app for the web was Apache, right? The Apache web mm-hmm. server. And that's really what allowed us to have the web and in the web in such a free way, as I think it's actually starting to be again, um, mm-hmm. but definitely in the you know uh, late 90s, early 2000s and, and a little beyond. The Apache web server is free software, um, FOSS. The applications built on it tended to have FOSS licenses, um, all of these businesses building their models tended to um, be the kinds of applications we might now call cloud applications. 
pretty centralized still, sure. But um, you go online, you get some sort of service, maybe you pay for it. Now, of course, the applications that you don't pay for, um, if you're not paying for it, you're most likely the product, mm. right? So mm. yep. your your surveillance about you as a user is, is what keeps the engine running for the Googles and so on, the Facebooks, et cetera. Of course, you know, the FOSS community with the kinds of strong ethics that they have, have always been worried about these sorts of problems, right? The fact that you can have a FOSS application um, and have FOSS code as many of these big tech apps do like the Facebooks and the Twitters and so on, have sort of a FOSS grounding, but then um, lock your users into some service that's spying on them, not Mm -hmm. release your modifications Mm -hmm. because you're technically not distributing your code, you're just hosting a service. All of that has been an issue for, for a long time and definitely from this web 2.0 ish era to the present day. So replacements have been created, right? For, you know, well, I guess I'll I'll start with the Google Docs question. Mm -hmm. Google Docs obviously is used pretty ubiquitously because it's so seamless um, and and Google does a really good job of, you know, trying to make it that way. Mm -hmm. There are, you know, alternatives there. One of the ones that I like is uh, something called CryptPad. Mm-hmm. Um, that gives you a full suite of, um, you know, document editor, um, spreadsheet, et cetera. You can find something like CryptPad hosted by some group, um, some intermediary. You can decide if you want to trust them. I believe the CryptPad developers themselves um, have hosting packages so you can like have an organization um, set up through them. And then you're supporting the software that also you're using, which is really cool. But also because this is free software, you know, you you can download the code and install it on your own server. So if Mm -hmm. you have a business or, Mm -hmm. you know, nonprofit or even as an individual, you can set up a server and do that. And that requires technical knowledge. I I realize that. And then it also does require, you know, real costs. Like you said, I think the apps that tend to start really pointing to this issue are some of the um, free software, the federated social platforms that have attempted to replace the Twitters and the Facebooks and so on. When I've tried to implement them myself, for example, you know, something like a a Mastodon or GNU Social, which is an older version, or Friendica or Diaspora, it requires, you know, uh, not only that know-how, but you also have to bring in a community of folks who who are going to communicate with each other, communicate with each other under some, you know, basic guidelines. And then also there is a cost creep, right? And the technology is great, right? You've got social media replacements that aren't spying on people that are talking to each other, generally speaking. So they federate, so they're able to share information and, and, and share content, et cetera. And, uh, you know, they're being run by your friendly neighborhood geek, but your friendly neighborhood geek (laughs) usually ends up with paying the bill as well. Hmm. So those models to me, they're good and there's varying levels of success, but they tend to trend towards the types of centralization that can be problematic and they don't end up as distributed or as as decentralized as they probably should be Um, Hmm. just because they're... They're basically um, trying to build a better, respectful version of these sort of Web 2.0-ish apps. Although I would say, to be fair, you know, that's starting to change. Um, Mastodon, for example, is starting to embrace real decentralization, starting to grow in such a way that um, you might want to call it Web 3 or whatever, Mm. whatever the terminology coming down the road is. As an individual user, you know, trying these things out, there's a lot of guidance out there. Choose a server, check it out, see what you think of it. I, of course, think that there's, as I've alluded to, there are changes coming down the pike. uh, One of the projects that I think is going to do that is the one I am building, helping to build. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's something called Panquake, panquake panquake.com. I'm the uh, security person for that. And we're building something really exciting, really decentralized and built upon blockchain technology. So for you folks who thought we weren't going to plug blockchain, there (laughs) there you go. Um, You can now check that off on your bingo cards, everybody. Exactly. But, um, you know, but the reason I say, you know, real decentralized, real web three is because I think what we're doing at Panquake is going to be revolutionary and different in a way that some of these other things aren't. I don't want to be 
Cavalier at dismissing uh, a lot of what's out there right now, but I do think for popular adoption, we've seen decades of really non-adoption of the FOSS uh, web platforms. And I think it's going to require um, embracing technologies like blockchain, um, thinking very strongly about peer-to-peer -peer structures and true decentralization to start moving in a, in a new direction, in a positive direction. And uh, that's something we're trying to do. All right. So last question before I let you go, what, what do you think the future of FOSS looks like? What, what's kind of on the horizon? Where do you, what, what interesting kind of aspects are, are, are coming down the pike that maybe it might be shifting in some sort of a fundamental way, or maybe there's some interesting products besides Pank Week that you, that you might want to plug that you know are coming down the pike. What, what's coming, what, what could we be excited about that's coming down the pike? Yeah, sure. So, um, I think uh, we're seeing a real shift in technology for the first time in at least a decade, perhaps more, as far as the network te technology that runs the internet is moving. The old cloud model is falling apart for a number of reasons, partially because these, these other decentralized apps um, can't really be stopped. <laughs> I'm, in my view, you know, the real exciting development, um, the real cool stuff, the, the fun stuff that people are going to be working on now and into the future is going to be in that decentralized space um, using technologies like blockchain. And it's just not going anywhere. So we have to think about it in such a way where it can have the same kind of ethics that free software was built upon that we really want to see. Um, the first thing we should think about is, well, we want it to be free software. We want it to be FOSS, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the truly exciting stuff, in my view, is the FOSS that's coming down the pike based upon these new models. The second thing we need to think about is strong security and privacy, because it's not just something we demand, but it's going to be something we require if mm -hmm. we're going to have these decentralized models, mm -hmm. right? Yep. We can't have a peer-to-peer -peer network that's spying on us. We just <laughs> came from a centralized right, right. thing that's right. spying on us. So, uh, you know, to me, the, a lot of those technologies are really cool. IPFS and some of those components from IPFS will be integrating into Panquake, you know, something called Lib Peer-to-Peer. -peer. You know, those pieces are really, really exciting stuff. Um, and they can really change, I think, a lot of the information flows that unfortunately right now are going through either Amazon servers or Google's or both, <laughs> generally yeah. speaking. Right. What else is cool that's coming? Well, um, I think it's possible for IoT and some of these other areas that have traditionally been locked down with non- FOSS proprietary models, or maybe they have that underlying layer of FOSS and then a lockdown proprietary top layer, et cetera. A lot of those, those IoT um, devices are starting to change, and that's a really exciting space as well. We're seeing more crowdfunded open hardware, which is very similar to free and open source software, right? You want to have hardware designs that are open and shareable and modifiable and remixable, et cetera. Those open hardware boards, um, you know, even the people, for example, making, you know, I don't know, uh, replacement Nintendo boards, right? So you can huh. play Nintendo from here into the future. Those are cool pro projects um, and they may seem like hobby things, but they're going to start, I think, taking over in a way um, that's going to be very difficult for um, the traditional centralized proprietary folks to combat when we can all have smart speakers that aren't Alexa mm, or, yes. you know, OK Google or whatever. Right. And we can have things that, you know, not only give us the services we want or the features we want, but again, don't do that spying. Yep. Um, are, are modifiable? Like people love customizing things if they're able to customize them and, and have that sort of creative drive. But, you know, it's got to also be in a place where it's usable by as I said earlier, my grandmother and so on. Right. We've reached that with the FOSS desktop. I think we really have. We're going to see that with these IoT devices. And we're certainly starting to see a real sea change and shift with the decentralized um, Web3 world. And I don't know, it's going to be a ride. There's going to be a lot of battles, but I guess I'm optimistic these days. I'm seeing a lot of positive change, so... Well, Sean, that was fascinating and uh, a topic I've wanted to cover for a long time and I'm just glad to have you back on the show. Thanks for coming on, Sean. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
All right, everybody, that was a great interview with Sean. So glad we got it back on the show. It's been way too long since I've had him on the show. We've kept in touch, but uh, I've been dying to get him back, and this was the perfect topic to bring Sean back for. So we're already over time. I just want to mention a couple quick things. Give this a try. Uh, think about this. You don't have to go the full Linux route if you don't want to, though I'll suggest uh, an option there in a minute. But try LibreOffice. That You can get the link in the show notes. And again, it, you look at your podcast app. Somewhere in there, they should list the show notes. Or you could always go to podcast dot firewalls don't stop dragons dot com and find all the show notes there find libra office that's l-i-b-r-e office and if you just search on that you will find it it's free you can run it on mac you can run it on windows try opening up some word files and some excel files you'll find that you can open them you can edit them you can save them you can share them with other people after you have opened and saved them it doesn't taint the files and it, it's quite good and it's and it's free so if you like working with you know doc files or constantly people are sending those to you, you can now use a different application to do those and you don't have to pay a ton of money for it. Now, if you do want to try Linux, first of all, if you've got a Mac, you've already got Unix. Uh, Mac OS is based on Unix. It's based on BSD Linux, I believe. Uh, you can open a terminal window and you can play around with some command line stuff. Uh, but under the covers, believe it or not, Mac OS is a Unix-flavored operating system. Even Windows now actually has Linux. If you want to, you can search for Windows subsystem for Linux, and you can actually install Linux on your Windows machine and play around with that at the command line. Now, regular Linux isn't command line. You don't have to get geeky and do everything at a command prompt. You know, if you run Linux as a regular full Linux environment, it looks like Mac. OS. It looks like Windows. It's you know, it's got a desktop. It's got icons on the desktop. It's got uh, toolbars. It's got browsers. You know, it it looks like any other regular computer you're used to working with. But if you want to get super geeky and get into the more low level stuff, or maybe run your own Linux server, I put a link in the show notes to some Linux classes you might check out that are free. And if you don't have an old computer lying around, if you if you don't have an old Windows box that you're about to upgrade, so you've got something you can convert to a Linux box, look at Raspberry Pi. And that's spelled P-I, not P-I-E. You can get this on Amazon. You can get this from uh, other companies as well. It's a $35 computer about the size of a deck of cards. It's bare, so you're going to want to buy a little case to put it in, and you're going to want to buy a power supply for it. Uh, you can buy that as a kit on Amazon for probably 60 bucks, maybe 70 bucks max. And then connect it to a keyboard, a mouse, and a monitor, and you've got a fully functioning Linux-based computer. Uh, one more thing, you'll need an SD card as well, uh, which those aren't too expensive. So, you know, like 80 bucks total, 100 bucks for sure, you will have a fully functional Linux-based computer that you can play around with. All right, so we're already over time, so let me wrap it up. Uh, for all my patrons out there, you're going to get some bonus content, a lot of bonus content from uh, Sean and I's discussion. We talk a little bit about the right to repair movement, and we dig in a lot more into his Panquake project. And I am definitely going to be in that. I've applied to be part of the 5,000-person beta. I've donated to the project. Uh, I will keep you posted on that as it happens, and you could go yourself to panquake.com right now. There's a Join tab or a Join button if you want to get involved with that and apply to be part of the 5,000-person beta. And it looks really cool. I can't wait for that to, to finally launch. And if you want to become a patron and get some of this great bonus content, just go to patreon.com and search for Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Again, if one of the many patron benefits is I send the show notes out, uh, usually on Saturday, uh, the Monday before the show, so you'll get to all the show notes sent directly to you. You'll get a preview of what that show is, and there's a lot of the great benefits too. I talk to people on Discord, which is a lot of fun. So anyway, so check that out at patreon.com. Obviously, you can look for my newsletter as well. Uh, go read the blog on firewallsdon'tstopdragons.com. And of course, you can get the book, Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons, which started all of this off. Okay, next week, I got a news show for you. And then I got a couple great interviews in the hopper, one on cell phone security and one on Microsoft's new Pluton project, all coming down the pike. So take care, everybody. Stay safe out there. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down.